Am I just to start? No, you're going to wait here. Uh, That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Timmy. I can't. Yeah. See, no, you're good, Dr. Parlett. Parlett. Yeah. I lost. I lost uh, Gary and you both. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. you can change that on your side. You can change up on the upper right hand side. Uh, Gallery view. Manipulate. Yeah. Exactly. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, now so, I'm. I'm. I'm good. So we can still hear you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. We're still here. Uh, Everyone uh, that's coming into the webinar, welcome, welcome back. If you joined us uh, with Dr. Mark Douglas earlier today, this is CARD P Day, Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics. Uh, thank you to CARD P uh, for putting together our speakers. Uh, Dr. Kim Parlett is up next. And we're just going to give ourselves a little bit of time, let everybody get in and get familiar with the interface. For those of you that are new to Zoom, just play around with the controls. You can see we have chat features, Q&A features, and the hands up feature. We're not using the hands up feature. If you have a question for Dr. Parlett, please put it in the Q&A section. Uh, if you're going to ask a question in the Q&A section, um, skim through the questions that are already in there. We'll try and keep the redundancy of questions uh, down to a minimum. Dr. Parlett's a cranky old man and does not like to uh, have to repeat himself. So. Uh, no, anyways, uh, this is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. We've been doing this series for many weeks now, and uh, all our speakers are volunteering their time, and we really appreciate that, because without that volunteering uh, of their time and not paying honorariums, uh, that, that's really helped us out. We couldn't have done it without them. Uh, we'd like we're, to thank- We're not getting paid? Yeah, we are not getting paid. Yeah, oh. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a third party out of state check. You'll be good with it, eh? So uh, back to thanking our sponsors. Thanks to the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. This is who you'll be receiving your CE credits through. Expect to see your CE credits show up in the next two to three days uh, in your email, um, and that will be coming to the email that you registered at for this webinar. Um, you will have a PDF. It's not personalized for you. Just make sure you put your name on there. Save that for your records just in case there's any complications down the road. If you're an AGD member, and we strongly encourage you uh, to look at becoming a member of the AGD, it's a great uh, organization. Um, we will report your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. Those credits will show up on your transcript within the next two to four weeks. If you saw a webinar or you missed a webinar, uh, you can go to YouTube, to Washington Academy of General Dentistry, we have a channel there. Remember to like, subscribe, and uh, ring the bell, and you'll be notified as new webinars are added. Unfortunately, if you watch a YouTube video of one of our presenters, we cannot issue CE credit for you. You'll see some flyers going by. Uh, some of these uh, webinars have already happened, just to kind of just... Uh, let you know who we had on the programs this week. We'd like to thank the International Academy of Nathology for putting together a great day on Monday, as did the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry on Tuesday. Thank you to Dr. Tran for his presentation yesterday on orthodontics and the general practice, two ways to start. Uh, and Terry Harris was on uh, yesterday as well. He has copies of all the questions that went into Q&A, and you should be looking for an email or correspondence from Terry answering those questions sometime in the next three or four days, I would guess. Um, just a reminder that uh, Tomorrow, we have Dr. Manu Karbash, who's going to do a presentation on COVID-19 and how to get your systems up in place so you can be up and running in your dental offices when we go back to work on Tuesday, May the 19th. Um, we have additional webinars lined up for next week, uh, and those will be going onto our Facebook page 
and onto our website in the next couple of days. Uh, one of those uh, webinars, well, there's going to be two webinars. For those of you in Washington State that need your opioid training and suicide training, we've lined up instructors for Monday for a uh, full day of CE. So that's six hours of CE on Monday, and that's three hours of opioid and three hours of suicide uh, awareness training. So uh, be looking at WashingtonAGD.org to sign up and get registered for that. We'll also be sending out emails as uh, we get that information and those registrations available. Like to thank again Comet USA, Patterson Dental, and we'd like to thank Sonoma, Homish County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society, uh, for their support for uh, emailing and communicating with all their constituents. We appreciate that. We thank the uh, WSDA for some of their background help as well. So we're getting close here um, to start time. We've got about half of our participants that have registered for this uh, webinar today. A wonderful turnout. We've got over 800 on this webinar. So uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, Dr. Parlett has for us today. Um, you might see some of the flyers that go by and they are actually flyers for upcoming CE courses, hands-on CE courses here in Seattle. We have a educational center uh, that we're able to have uh, 140 people in the lectures. We're able to do um, probably 60 uh, participants hands-on. And then we also have five operatories set up for hands-on courses. So we're able to offer hands-on orthodontic training. We have an implantology from A to Z uh, continuum that's been um, presented by Dr. Yassine. Many of you have watched some of Dr. Yassine's free webinars over the weeks here. Uh, he will be starting up that uh, implantology um, uh, series again in the fall as we get back to work and get, get rolling and knowing what our social distancing and requirements are going to be in academic settings there. So uh, there's QR codes on the flyers that are going by that will allow you to register for upcoming webinars. If you miss one of those QR codes, just go to www washingtonagd.org and you should be able to register there. Um, we are working hard to upgrade our website. We're looking at down the road where you'll actually be able to go on and get on-demand CE uh, and uh, we're trying to do that at a real reasonable cost and so be uh, coming back maybe in a month or two months and, and taking a look at our WashingtonAGD.org uh, website because uh, we should be able to get some C uh, elements on there uh, that uh, will be of interest to you and allow you to do CE uh, in the comfort of your own home. We've also done some neat things recently. We did a hands-on oral surgery virtual course with Dr. Carl Corner last uh, Friday, Saturday. And what we did was actually we took, um, we had models that Dr. Corner had made up. We had the supplies, the bone grafting materials. Uh, we had the instruments and uh, hand pieces. And we actually mailed those out. And then people were able to log in via Zoom. We were set up in a meeting format. So uh, people could show uh, Dr. Corner uh, what they were doing and that, and it actually worked out really well. So uh, that may be something we continue in the future because it, we know with all the meetings being canceled, including the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics Annual Meeting in Halifax, it's a, you know, it's a crying shame that we won't be able to to do that meeting. Uh, I know Dr. Fling was going to be there. Uh, myself, um, uh, let's see, uh, David Clark, uh, all these great friends of Card P. And it's nice to see we've got uh, great synergy between our different organizations, the AGD, the WAGD, Card P, uh, you know, et cetera, the International Academy of Nathology, Arkansas AGDP, AGP, AGD, pardon me. So let's see, we're just about at 12 o'clock noon. I'll just check the numbers here, make sure. 
yeah, we're, we're about at 60% now. We'll just give it a little bit of time here and I'll go through all that spiel again. Sorry, folks, for those of you that have heard it a million times, but welcome. This is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. These webinars are being brought to you uh, at no charge uh, because of our sponsorship and the, the sharing of our different organizations, including the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, the University of Washington School of Dentistry uh, CE department. The University of Washington School of De uh, Dentistry CE department will be emailing you your CE credits within two to three days. Uh, you can be uh, looking for your CE credits if you're an AGD member being uploaded to the Academy of General Dentistry um, itself. Those will show up in your transcripts uh, within two to four four weeks. We'd like to thank our other sponsors, uh, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society. Uh, thank you to, on the corporate side, to Comet USA and Patterson Dental. Thank you again for this week of speakers are brought to you by the International Academy of Nathology, Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry, and Card P Day is being brought to you by Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. Well, it looks like we can probably uh, stop sharing this screen here. We'll let Dr. Parlett uh, get set up. Um, I just want to introduce you to a, a really uh, good friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Parlett is a graduate of the University of Toronto and is fellow and past president of the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. He is a member of the numerous dental org organizations, including the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. He practices general dentistry in Bracebridge, Ontario, with a focus on complex rehabilitative occlusal medicine. He is a clinical instructor with the Vienna School of Interdisciplinary Dentistry at the University of Vienna, Austria. Dr. Parlett, welcome. I know you're kind of from uh, way up there in Northern Ontario, aren't you? I like your background, Timmy, the Great White North. That's perfect. What an yeah. introduction. Yeah, well, let me introduce you properly then with a <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, yeah that's good Tammy that's good all right go ahead share your screen all right I'm hoping that's gonna happen all right here we go <laughs> and see if that'll advance now or not we'll try something else hang on that looks like it's working on our side here yeah, it didn't on mine. That's the only problem. But um, let me try this one. Okay. Are you good there? We're good here. Thank you very All right. much. That's good. I, I can start now. We're fine. Let's go. Thank you, Timmy, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. We're, I, I think we've got people from all around the world in this webinar today. So as we approach the seventh week of our lockdown, it's a pleasure to be here and I'd like to thank everyone that has participated and especially Dr. Hess for his tireless effort in putting these amazing lineup of presenters together. Before I start, just a little introduction. Currently, I have a full-time practice in Bracebridge, as Timmy said, in my spare time. I'm fortunate enough to be able to go to Vienna about five times a year where I'm a clinical instructor at, at VizEd, which is located in the, at the University of Vienna in the dental clinic. The basic curriculum that we teach there was developed to follow the teaching philosophy of Dr. Rudy Slavicek. Some of the, of the systematics we teach may seem a little different than the North American education, but I hope you'll find this webinar informative. Professor Slavicek was a forerunner and progressive thinker in occlusal medicine. He is the founder of the Vienna School of Interdisciplinary Dentistry, and he was involved in the development of the SAM instrumentation system. We like to joke that SAM stands for Slavicek and Mach when it, uh, they say it's a student articulator method. He popularized and developed protocols for the use and the interpretation of condylography. He was the dean of the, of the University Dental School in Vienna. 
and he wrote the highly regarded book on occlusal medicine titled The Masticatory Organ. And I, I uh, tell everybody that, especially young dental uh, graduates, that if they ever get a chance, this is a must read. It's tough to follow Dr. Robley and Dr. Robbins, both of whom have had a great impact on my practice. There's nothing I could add to their eloquent presentation. So my presentation today won't directly address smile design, global diagnosis, or airway, even though I feel if you don't say something about it, um, you're just not current. So for the sake of being relevant here, um, here are my two airway, here are my two slides. Here's one on um, airway and obstructive sleep apnea. And here's one from Agne and Manier and Belzer on aesthetic parameters, and, and that's it for those topics. What I am here to talk about today is occlusal concepts for complex rehabilitation. That some of you for maybe a bit of a review, but for others it'll seem kind of foreign. It's an approach to occlusion I like to call occlusion by design. Guided by some data, supported by literature, some geometry, and some basic design principles, I hope to be able to give you a few more tools to, to build a better mousetrap. We've seen and heard a lot about the chocolate side of the teeth. I call that the buckle side. Dr. Slavacek calls it the chocolate side. Most lecturers today seem to assume that occlusion is somewhat second in nature and everybody just knows it. They lecture for an hour about the six front teeth and then magically at the end, it's like uh, uh, an epiphany, a rehabilitation appears. We have had a couple of decades now where occlusion hasn't been taught in any rigorous format in our dental schools. And so today I hope to bring a little of that back into focus. The functional surfaces of the teeth can be beautiful too, but we must have an idea of the function that's required. And what functions are we talking about? Dr. Slavacek proposed that this cybernetic model of the human being that includes the masticatory organ. You can see that the organ has multiple functions in this model. The functions that we're talking about include mastication, speech, breathing or respiration, posture, appearance, aesthetics, and stress management in the form of bruxism. So all of these functions except aesthetics are heavily influenced by the lingual surfaces of the teeth. These are the surfaces that we must, that, that we really pay the least amount of attention to. I love this quote from Shaw, and if I can just read it. The writings cut with such precision upon the complex patterns of teeth may indeed be the hieroglyphics, but even so, it was surely no random and meaningless scribbling. More probably, it was a real organic language in which the principles of design and mechanics were inscribed. And we might yet succeed in deciphering it if we first took the pains to learn its dynamic alphabet and master the elements. These so-called hieroglyphics include ridge and groove direction, cusp height, fossa depth, location of ridges, grooves, cusp and fossa, relationships of the lower anterior teeth with the lingual concavity of the maxillary anterior teeth. There's a false sense of security in the concept that canine guidance or mutually protected occlusion obviates the need to control these elements because the thought is that if we have a good anterior disclusion, the posterior teeth will disclude in dynamics free of interferences. But wait, there's a lot more to it than that. But these are the micro elements of occlusion that you're all familiar with. Today, we're focusing on the macro elements of occlusion that you may or may not be familiar with. I know I wasn't. So what are occlusal concepts? Occlusal concepts are artificial concepts of order for a therapeutic goal. The problem is we have many occlusal concepts which have been universally applied irrespective of individual vari variations. Depending on our dental education, we tend to have one occlusal concept or philosophy and it tends to get applied universally. And so all of us at one time or another have reflected on why some pay procedures work for some of the time for on some of the people while failing miserably in others. Our occlusal or TMD diagnosis can't lead to the same splint therapy. We must consider that each patient has individual characteristics that make them unique. Averages and regressions to the mean are functions of research and statistical analysis, but can be totally inappropriate for your patient. Also, this concept 
is what makes much of our research misleading or useless when dealing with our new evidence-based reality. This universal application of a single concept has several problems if one subscribes to the one-size-fits-all philosophy. Some of the problems that I see coming down the road with the rehabilitations I'm doing and some of the, the redos we're doing are lack of adequate diagnosis and therapeutic concepts. We have no functional occlusion concept. There's no objective assessment. There's no consideration of the patient's skeletal type. There's no consideration of the dysfunction in speech, mastication, swallowing. There's no control of the or understanding of occlusal plane. There's no adequate control of the vertical dimension. And there's inappropriate palatal surface inclination of the incisors and the canines. There's a lack of congruity of between the two arches, like which class is it? We're going to do a class one occlusion, class two, one to one relationship, one to two relationship. And there's no evaluation of the compensation mechanisms of the cranial mandibular system. Compensation mechanisms like the articular compensation, skeletal compensations, and dental alveolar compensations. So what is your occlusal concept? Can we achieve coupling of the anterior teeth? Do we have a flexible lateral truce of control? Can we achieve a class one occlusion, one to one or one to two relationship? Can we achieve symmetry and function and aesthetics? What influence will our compensation factors have? And how can we use them to achieve our occlusal goals? So our patient presents with a number of variables. We must try to understand how each one is critical to our success. Functional occlusal geometry deals with the interrelationship between posterior guidance, anterior guidance, and occlusal plane. We have anterior controls and posterior controls. If the anterior teeth are not coupled, then it's up to the posterior control to function in a manner that minimizes load to the teeth and the TM joints. The control system is dependent on anterior, lateral, and protrusive guidance, and the posterior control is determined by the condylar motion patterns. Cusp inclination and occlusal plane angulation dramatically affect the dynamic situation of these two control systems. So we have a skeletal relation, a dental alveolar relation, a curve of speed at a vertical dimension. Inside that, we have an occlusal plane to consider cusp inclination, condylar guidance, and anterior guidance. Some of these things we can control and modify and others we can't. So we talk about static and dynamic occlusion. If you can't measure it, you're limited to a couple of different things. These are your possibilities. To measure something, we need instrumentation. Complex diagnosis and therapy is a three-dimensional problem and requires instrumentation to navigate our way through diagnosis, treatment planning, and therapy. To date, I still prefer analog, but we're trying to find the best marriage of both analog and virtual. Instrumentation is going to be essential to this process. We want to have fully programmed articulators with the sagittal condylar inclination and Bennett, hinge axis mounted with orbital reference mounting models. We have to have a reference position a therapeutic position, which may be intercuspal position or reference position or therapeutic reference position or your version of centric relation. Vertical dimensions set with an anterior corresponding anterior pin height, occlusal plane and cusp inclination. We're gonna get into all of that. Just a comment about hinge axis location and mounting. It serves to provide another level of accuracy. It allows us to relate everything to axis orbital plane and not Frankfurt. And it allows any change in vertical dimension without a change in occlusal contacts on the articulator. These three different pictures show three different types of, of a, a little hinge articulator, a regular arbitrary uh, articulator with a arbitrary hinge axis mounting and a kinematic face mask, just showing the difference in, in what we call systematics and precision. This one, this, one, this one has a very high level of precision, but the systematics is wrong. This one has a poor level of precision, but the systematics is basically correct. 
on the on the far side, I'm sorry I'm pointing and, and thinking you guys can see that, but you can't. On the far side where we're looking at the hinge axis mounting, the systematics is correct and the accuracy and the precision is is highly accurate. And that's what we're that's what we're striving for in in the type of patients that were the 30% where we have lots of lots of problems. They're not all healthy. Whether analog or digital, three-dimensional problems require a coordinate system or we're lost in space. A coordinate system allows you to synchronize all the instrumentation if we format to the same reference plane. We're going to use axis orbital plane, not Frankfurt plane. So we chose axis orbital plane and now we can look at all the instrumentation in the same workspace. We see our articulated models, the cephalometrics, and the movement recorded data in the same space. And this will be particularly important when we go to virtual articulation going forward. And some of the problems we have with the current thing is forming a reference, a forming a reference plane and not just having models sitting in space doing something. Just to, so my, there's a really good article that just came out and by a good friend of mine and colleague on uh, Dr. Ellard Urey in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry in February, where he suggested after, after looking at analog and digital that he suggested that a combined approach for complex dentistry is an accurate and viable approach to take at this time. So he's suggesting that for the large reconstructions, you have to be able to go back and forth. It's not, you can't go all virtual at this point but you can marry the two and have a very good result. So we have a playground to work in and we have some instrumentation and to help us, but the goal of our planning and design is to control the factors at our disposal and to maximize the efficiency of masticatory dynamics while minimizing the effects of excess parafunctional loading. That's our goal. There's several variables that we have to work with. We can look at the, Sagittal condylar inclination, which really isn't variable, it's given. We can look at the maxillary front teeth from an aesthetic and phonetic and positioning, and we can modify those with either crowns or orthodontics. We have the mandibular front teeth, and we can, we can modify those. The skeletal classification, we can't change, but the occlusal plane in the vertical dimension, we can't. So we have a number of, of variables that we can work with. So let's start with anterior guidance. What do we know about anterior guidance? We know that anterior guidance, what is the function of the upper front teeth? We know that they have to be avoided in mastication, that they're used in speech, and they're modified sensoric organs, which means they're highly proprioceptive. They function with the soft tissues, the upper and lower lip, not only for aesthetics and speech, but also for proprioception. And we have the aesthetics of the function in the smile. The lingual concavity of the upper front teeth determines the protrusive pattern of the lower jaw movement. And the lingual surface is avoided in mastication and the incisal is used in speech. We know from mastication studies of Lundin and Gibbs, we can see if I can adjust, get my pointer working. And uh, pointer, excuse me, pen. We can see in this picture from Lundin and Gibbs that they, we have isolated very light contacts. Sorry. We have very light contacts and, and in, in chewing patterns on the incisors, but we have heavy broad contacts on the, on the canines. When we talk about front teeth, they're single rooted teeth and they don't have much bony support, but they're very important to give proprioception signals. This is why they're a control system. We consider them a control system. They don't guide the mandible in, in forward movement with a lot of pressure. They support the masticatory patterns, the speech patterns in a functional manner by acting as a proprioceptive mechanism for those, for those patterns that are developed. Front teeth are avoided in function because if they're touched, for example, in mastication, the mandible automatically is pulled back by the muscles. It's a proprioceptive reflex. And this is a very important concept. Front teeth are avoided in mastication. We know from papers by Trulson, who looked at the coding of, of tooth contacts, that the pro, they're highly sensitive to proprioception 360 degrees, the front teeth are, where the back teeth are only sensitive to, to lateral 
to lateral directional forces. And that, that's really important because the, the, it's, it's the lateral forces on, on posterior teeth that are very um, dis, dysfunctional and cause a lot of problems. The teeth can, posterior teeth can load really well. That's what they're designed for, but they do not like lateral forces. And, and so built into that is a, is a, is a coding proprioception that that's where they're sensitive. Now, front teeth are sensitive to every directional force. So what's the difference between guide and control? Incisors control, canines guide. That means canines are gonna take the load and they're going to cause the disclusion, but incisors are going to create the, 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 the patterns of mastication and speech that we, and swallowing, that we, that we use. Sometimes we mix up apples and oranges and lump all the six front teeth together. So from a diagnostic, st from a diagnostic standpoint, we need to measure an existing situation. Do we wanna duplicate what they have? Do we wanna modify it with restorative procedures or orthodontics? We can do this with a trial and error approach. We can do it with temporization and let the patient grind it, grind it in. Or we can do a custom incisal guide table doing what they have, but that if it's bad, you just rebuild that. But for proper diagnosis and therapy, we should measure it. We can make a silicone impression of guiding surfaces used as a table that's parallel to the axis orbital plane. We can look at the dynamics of the, of the models on the articulator and mark out the, the pathways that are the guidance pathways. And then we can cut the silicone perfectly and we can scan it and digitize it or photograph it. It's cut so that we can see it's parallel to axis orbital plane here. And we can get measurements that look something like this. So we can see a guidance angle from the function point one to function point two. That's where it would be in, in center or ICP is function point one to function point two is the most lingual incisal edge of the, of the front teeth. So now we have specific values for the functional surfaces of the anterior teeth. And what does that mean? How will we use it? We want to coordinate the anterior guidance with the joint guidance. Is there a relationship? Is there a relationship between anterior control and condylar inclination? This developmental series of pictures makes it very clear. With no teeth, with no teeth, there's no eminence. As the teeth erupt, the joint develops to the changing functional patterns dictated by the tooth contacts. We want to know, is there a numerical relationship between incisal guidance and condylar inclination that we can use? So what we're looking for, is there a relationship between incisal guidance and condylar guidance? We have some studies. There's a physiologic relationship between anterior incisal guidance and the posterior sagittal condylar inclination. McCorse in 1980 did a study and he found it to be five degrees. Slavicek in 84 did a study and um, found that a difference between the two to be about nine degrees. Ortlieb 9.8 and Sato 10.0. The difference between the, the four that I can gather from talking to all, all, of, the, all of these fellows was just the difference in um, um, multi-racial, multi um, multi-ethnic uh, uh, population group and, and uh, the, the numbers, uh, the end values. But we believe somewhere between five and 10 is a good representation of where, where, where we see it. And it's variable. We see that in studies that we've done at the University of Vienna that Dr. Slavicek did over a number of years when he was the, the dean there and, and could run programs, they haven't, this particular study had an end value of 4,350 patients presenting at random to the dental clinic. And they found that there is a relationship between the anterior control and the posterior control. And that as it gets, as the anterior guidance and post, posterior guidance gets steeper, the two get closer together. So that's why when we see McCorris to, to Sato going from five to 10, there's quite a, 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 a say convergence. As we approach 60 degrees, the two become closer at, at 40 degrees, one may be 40, one may be 30. And, but as we get up to 60, the two, the two converge so that they're 
pretty much the same. That's what the, that's what the study is showing. So if we believe that anterior guidance is a good thing and we can relate it to our posterior control, then our, the next question becomes how much guidance? How much, is, how much is enough or how steep is too steep? If anterior guidance is the objective, beware of the pitfall. We can have too much of a good thing. So what if the cuspid disclusion angle is too steep? Let's look at a case. This case has severe muscle problems, chief complaint, headaches, sore, chewing muscles all the time. Occlusion looks pretty good, but a flat, flat, a very flat profile and retroclined upper anterior teeth. The anterior silicone cut of the teeth shows a very steep lingual concavity and restricted function. We look at the uh, cephalometric profile of the patient and just pay attention to a couple things. The inner incisal angle is way too big and the sagittal condylar inclination that we're talking about, we can look at the sagittal condylar inclination here and see that it's 45 on one side, 39 on the other side and say 42.7 average, but the anterior guidance, the anterior guidance here and here what we're talking about is the functional surface of the inside of the tooth, not, not the long axis of the tooth. The functional surface that that has to deal with is 77.6. So that's way too steep. Number one rule is we should never exceed 60 degrees. And the two as they approach should be really close to each other. So the difference between the two is really way too strong. And obviously the treatment for that, that patient on, on virgin teeth would be to do some orthodontics and, and uh, correct that problem. So uh, well, experimental design, we know that if the incisal guidance is too steep, what happens? We get hyperactivity of the masticatory muscles. We get lateral displacement of the mandible. We get temporal mandibular dysfunction and we get resurtrusive grinding path movements with digastric muscle activity. So what that means is that the hyperactivity of the masticatory muscles, we get a lateral displacement of the mandible posteriorly. This is, this is really important because this is very destructive. And anteriorly, we get a resurtrusive grinding pattern. So if this was our normal lateral disclusion pattern, we get a pattern that now goes re, re sertrusively, and that also affects the condylar elements. So exper experimental designs have shown a significant impact on steep cuspid design on function. Another factor to consider is the functional space. We have to consider the overbite overjet relation and the inner incisal angle to be confident that the functional space is sufficient. Okay, that kind of space is needed because when we see if I can show you if the video works and it does, what happens with that movement when we see a immediate truce of movement or a lateral truce of guidance here, unfortunately what happens when it's too steep is we see a resurtruce of movement back in this condyle. Okay, so that condyle goes up, that condyle goes up and back. And that's about the worst thing that can happen because when you go up and back into the retrodiscal tissue, you're gonna have lots of problems and you're gonna be on the back of the disc. So as you're going back and you're on the back of the disc, the disc wants to come forward and you get a lot of inflammation, a lot of pressure on an area that isn't designed to support. So those are very troubling to us when we have a steep anterior guidance. So in looking at the designing, designing this with the instrumentation, we, can, we have pre-milled functional guides that produce the required incisal guide angles based on the mandibular dynamic situation from ICP to the selected protrusive pathway. So if we put in protrusive inserts that positions us to the incisal edge, the, the length of that incisor is, is, the functional surface is preconditioned to that protrusive insert on this incisal guide table that's programmed to the horizontal condylar inclination that we've measured. I, I must say that um, I, as, as uh, um, Dr. Fling would say, I have no dog in the hunt here. I don't sell instrumentation. I don't have anything to do with the instrumentation. It's possible to do this with many of the other articulator systems. So for all of you out there, 
um, please be very aware that it's the concept I'm stressing here and that the instrumentation, you could use SAM, you could use Danar, you could use whatever, you, it's to know how to use it to be able to do this. So again, we have the ability to custom design the incisal guidance for the patient on, on, on this system married to the horizontal condylar inclination. So we want to be within 10 degrees of each other. And as they get steeper, we get closer and closer. So let's look at condylar guidance then. If we look at condylar guidance, condylar measurement, what is condylar guidance? What is condylar movement? Condylar measurement is dependent on all the structures that control or limit or guide movement. Some of us were, were early on were thought that we could measure the angle of the eminence and that would be the same as, as the condylar inclination. Recording jaw movement is much more complicated than that. It's way more than the articular eminence angle. The TM joint is a complex structure. All joint movement is morphologically guided by the eminence. It's muscularly steered by all the muscles. It's ligamentously limited. And all of this together produces a complex movement that we see in condylography. So there's a rotation and a translation of an object that isn't circular in motion. Between that is a biconcave disc and it goes from the thick to the thin to the thick part of the disc as it travels. There's no way that movement can be exactly the same as the eminence. And looking at condylar inclination and articular programming, we're taught that when in doubt, 30 degrees is a good arbitrary setting. Current research doesn't support this as a therapeutic concept. This particular study of 302 patients showed a wide variation in condylar track inclinations. The condylar track inclinations um, show strong deviations on top of that. And the mean for horizontal condylar inclination was 48.8, not, not 30, but 48.8. So if you're going to err, um, go a little steeper. 30 degrees isn't, isn't, isn't enough. This is not a new uh, condylography. We're talking about a, uh, a jaw movement recording device. This is not a new idea. We've had recorders since the early 1800s. There's several things that make this type of recorder unique. The ability to measure mandibular movement at the condylar rotational axis as close to the lateral poles as possible minimizes geometric distortion. The measurement of lateral side to side Bennett movement at the condyles because of the ability of the styli to move in and out. And the ability to measure rotation in, in degrees is a function of this particular type of recorder that has two recording styli. It also has the ability to measure velocity through time and distance. That gives us the ability to time even a disc displacement and look at the dynamics of, of, of disc displacements. The flexibility to record with either a paraclusal clutch or a functional clutch. So in the old days when we, when we used panography, um, there was a clutch that went over top of, of both, both jaws. Now we can fabricate one that, that goes on the bottom jaw only and um, lets the teeth come together um, so that we can look at centric relation, centric occlusion, uh, mastication, all the functions and how the teeth affect the, the joint through those kind of systems. These systems have developed into sophisticated electronic or computerized recorders. This particular system probably has the most scrutiny in studies, so I, I like to use that. They, we've had MRI and cadaver data that's been correlated with tra tracings in several studies to determine the sensitivity and specificity of the instrumentation to, in determining joint pathology through dynamic analysis. It goes something like this. We have a hinge axis and a reference position in an orbital plane and the tracing of the hinge axis. A normal mandibular border movement like opening protrusion or mediatrusion makes a sagittal tracing It is a smooth, concave tracing traveling below the axis orbital plane at about 40 to 55 degree inclination for the first five millimeters. In healthy patients, all three of these tracings are coincident for the first six to eight millimeters, protrusion, mediatrusion, 
and opening all go on the same tracing. Again, we, can, we, get, we get printouts and we can look at the coordinate system for measurements in a hundredth of a millimeter. Graphically, we can visualize and measure any movement in three planes of space. So if we can indicate the coordinates in that space of a six-year molar, we can get a printout or a, and a video of, of that molar moving um, in, in three dimensions, a frontal view, a horizontal view, and a sagittal view. This is a particular view of the right and left condyles. From the front, from the top, looking at the down, as if you were looking down at the top of their head, and a sagittal one from a sagittal flag looking at the side of their face. So armed with columnarography, we're now able to locate hinge axis for accurate reproduction of the rotational movements. We can take a Ceph with a hinge axis location tattooed on, the, on that to be able to reference both to the same coordinate system. And we can program a fully adjustable articulator. The purpose being so that the fu functional structure we build is determined by the movements acquired by the condylography. The form will follow. The developmental anatomy is dictated by the data from the condylography. Individual occlusal anatomy is dictated and recorded by the functional pathways. So let's look at cusp inclination. Cusp inclination and occlusal plane angulation dramatically affect the dynamic situation of these two control systems. We're able to modify both. Cusp inclination is important for both concepts of sequential guidance and disocclusion angle. The ideal range for a good cusp inclination in the posterior is maybe 25 to 30 degrees, but we have to compromise this parameter to meet our other objectives sometimes. We know from studies that the research on cusp inclination by Sato and one by Slavacek is consistent and supports the concept of sequential guidance. Research on cusp inclination. Sorry. We can, see, we can see from the chart, the top one is Slavacek, the bottom one is Sato, but we can see that the, from the front teeth to the posterior teeth, we go from 57 to 41 to 54 on the laterals, canines 48, 36, 29. We see a sequential disclusion in this study. Now the one the Japanese did from Kanagawa Dental College had, had 10,292 patients in the study. And again, another study by Leisure that showed progressive change in guidance angles from canines to sevens. The group function has a much shallower range. From these studies, it showed a clear dominance of the front group to lateral truce of side. And also in was a lack, a very, another interesting feature of that was the lack of concavity in the section teeth from K9 to 7. There's a much stronger concavity in um, central and lateral incisors. And as we get to the cuspids, the lingual concavity or the functional surfaces that causes that disclusion is much flatter. And by the time we get to the molar, it's, it's much shorter, of course, and, ve and very flat. These studies form the basis for defining groups based on saddle condylar inclination and Bennett movement to produce the sequence tables that we use to define our guidance pathways. And in blue is an example of a, a, sequ a pre-milled sequence pathway that this particular articulator system uses. Each inclination of the front guide is designed from a mathematical determination of the guide angle that would be appropriate if that tooth was the singular guidance. The articulator program is defined by the condylography and reconfigured for the articulator at a chosen intercondylar distance. So the computer takes a condylography that's measured at say, for example, a patient had an intercondylar distance, the flags were out here and the measurement was 155. And we have movements like this going back and forth. Then when the computer takes it down to um, 110, it adjusts those, me those measurements so that when we program these inserts into it, they're adjusted from that patient's particular um, geometry of 155, let's say, down to 110. The mathematics is, it was done and it's, e it's easy on a computer. So we have some pre-milled ones that cover just about every example that you could have. And then there's a 
custom and sizal guide table that you can use to adjust your own, like most of the articulators. So now that we've introduced the concept of sequential occlusion with canine dominance, see how this is familiar and what occurs in nature and reverse through ontogenesis. We know when the teeth are coming in, how they erupt. The six-year molars and the lateral incisors typically erupt first, and they're our first guidance system. It's at this point that we start to develop the form of our articular eminence and, and we start developing our motion patterns. These are the first real restrictions and, and guidance to lateral movement. The front teeth have come in initially and started the protrusive patterns that were there and initiated that. But the lateral guidance is, is developed first by the six and then the two and then the fours come in. This is another reason we're in early development of teeth, these fours come in and they act as, as a strong conditioner to the development of proper lateral guidance. Extracting them at this point is sometimes th is, is not a good thing for the development of the joint. The joint, however, so, and lastly, the threes and the fives come in and they fully erupt and take over control of the lateral movement for the final development of joint dynamics. The joint, however, is always in a permanent state of adaption throughout life. It's just not so dramatic at later stages. The sequence will go in reverse with aging and attrition through life. So we can design our occlusion to support wear and load through time by using this concept, almost like reverse engineering. In the wax up of the sequential table, it's adjusted to developing the guidance on each tooth from back to front. This is important. Most wax up techniques do not do this. Once you wax in the canine, it eliminates your ability to properly prepare any other guidance service. Okay. So we find these concepts in mature dentition. We can re reproduce it in wax and we can transfer it to our final rehabilitation. So what about occlusal plane? By definition, the occlusal plane is calculated from the tip of the central incisor to the distal buccal cusp of the lower six molar. The occlusal plane is referenced to the axis orbital plane, which allows us to work in the articulator system. We can set up the occlusal plane with an occlusal plane guide. In practice, you can set this up on a predetermined occlusal plane using the occlusal plane guide referenced to axis orbital plane on your articulator. Or you can analyze, you can use it to analyze a pre-existing condition of the patient on the, on the articulator. Just an example of how that works. We're doing a wax up and the first thing we're setting is one of our centric holding cuffs on the six-year molar to the occlusal plane. And what difference does it make? Because changing the inclination of the occlusal plane has a dramatic effect on dynamics. We know that six to eight degrees of disclusion of the posterior to teeth provides for a safety factor during parafunctional movement without allowing the posterior teeth to come as close as possible during excursive chewing movements without the potential of non-working side interferences. I never really understood this, but basically what we're, what Dr. Dr. Slavacek taught us was that if you have six to eight degrees of clearance in the posterior teeth and you're under heavy parafunctional load and with compression of the disc, with compression of the joint, with compression of the mandible, that still gives you enough freedom that your teeth are going to disclude even under heavy parafunctional load. If you get too much disclusion, then in mastication, we're not getting good efficiency. We're not getting good chewing function. It's like the patient that comes in that says they can't chew their lettuce well. They can't chew their food well. They're swallowing their whole food. So it's important for us to try to develop the most efficient system. If they're chewing more, if they're not chewing their food well, if they're loaded too, if their teeth are too far apart, they have all kinds of problems, including in indigestion and, and heavy muscle um, use. 
sore muscles, lots of other problems. So the disclusion angle serves as the primary step towards planning of guidance surfaces in this therapeutic approach. We'd like to be in the range where we have eight to 12 degrees of disclusion. Too much would be too much space. As I said before, it decreases your chewing efficiency and you don't chew your food well. The other thing we have is if you, have, if you don't have enough, you can see that with the occlusal plane is too steep, or the disclusion angle is not enough, we get posterior interferences. So we see that post occlusal plane, the secondary occlusal plane, people forget about the sevens all the time. And we see a heavy, strong interference there. The disclusion angle is not high enough. So what about skeletal relation? Don't forget about the divisions into skeletal classes and variations in high and low angles. This is it's important for the orthodontist, but also for the prostodontist and restorative dentists. Skeletal compensations or decompensations can be a major factor in our diagnosis and treatment plan. If you have a high class, high class two high angle case and you need more room for your implants or crowns, this is a problem because increasing the vertical dimension will cause more problems with your occlusal scheme. Like a class one would become a half cusp class two if you open it up. Racial aesthetics, lip incontinence, occlusal plane, et cetera, all compromised. By reducing the vertical and closing them down, you could resolve many issues, turning a class two into a class one. Better aesthetics, flattening of the occlusal plane, coupling of the anterior teeth. The occlusal concept will also vary with skeletal relation. Slavicek introduced the concept of the functional dividing plane and the functional dividing plane divides the type of guidance concept you'll be dealing with considering the skeletal and dental alveolar relationships. Every high angle class two case can't achieve a canine guided occlusion or canine controlled occlusion. He proposed a line drawn between uh, perpendicular from spina mentalis right there to the occlusal plane defines the occlusal concept in terms of skeletal relation as a canine protected or group function. So you can see that depending on the skeletal relation, we would have a tendency to canine or group function. If we, I can, my pen died. So if I can get my cursor up here. All right, so this is obviously because where this, where the perpendicular functional dividing plane is, all the teeth ahead of that line in green would be involved in your guidance system. So this would be a tendency to group function. This example would be a tendency to canine guided or mutually protected occlusion. And when I do that, I can't advance. So back down to here, sorry. During treatment planning and therapy, we have the ability to modify vertical dimension. Why the big mystery though? As early as 1938, Clyde Schuler and R. Trench were both reported on problems of reconstruction at an increased vertical dimension. And ever since there's been a lot of controversy and confusion regarding vertical dimension and whether you can change it. A systematic review by Abdullah in Quintessence volume 43, May 2012, concluded that vertical dimension increases up to five millimeters are safe and predictable. There are advantages and disadvantages to increasing vertical dimension. Conventional prostodontic programs that have not utilized the diagnostic potential of cephalometrics in my opinion. Ricketts was the first to publish cephalometric standards on vertical facial height. We have three measurements in the literature with statistical significance. Ricketts lower face height with a mean of 47 degrees and Slavicek's lower face height with a mean of 43.65 degrees and Slavicek's anterior gonial angle of 72.62. Ricketts was significantly higher than Slavicek, but Slavicek used a much larger database and inclusion of multicultural data and gender specific differentiation. So what we C is lower face height and anterior gonial angle. Again, 
really statistically significant numbers when you talk about a, in, or a, a patient sample of 2150. There's also a high correlation of anterior gonial angle to lower face height, which allows for classification based on the relation of upper and lower jaw to skull and can lead to a more individualized approach to vertical dimension. But the two angles we look at are anterior gonial angle and lower face height, and they have a high correlation. And therefore, we typically use Slavicek's lower face height with a mean of 43.65 in our diagnosis and treatment planning. So just a quick look at how we use this. This Kenny had a skeletal class two, vertical dimension reduced, severe over eruption of the anteriors, a lack of posterior support, and severe erosion of all the teeth. This is just a typical day in the, in the office. Several problems, unfortunately he came because he wanted the two implants uh, a, a person did for him restored. And one, one is of course back, back here. And the other one, I, can, I think you can see one, one here and the other one over, over here. So we have a bit of a space problem and, and um, um, somehow they ignored all the other problems that he has to place two implants. So moving forward, you can see the, the severe erosion, abrasion, attrition, an over eruption that he has, and, but let's see how this, this works. Okay, the cephalometric verbal analysis indicates a diminished lower face height. Let's see if we can quantify that. We look and we see that on the left-hand side of the screen, the lower face height by Slavicek, the norm is 42.9, and he has a value of 35.5. We can go to a virtual treatment objective showing the average values which is, and standard deviations. So the average values are green. One standard deviation is in the purple and the pink is the is a two standard deviations. So we can easily adjust the computer and by, by just with a, with a mouse go to the left-hand side of the screen, put our, cur put our crosses in the green area somewhere and uh, um, see the the change in our 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 lower face height and our vertical dimension. So we can see that we've gone from 35.5 to 38.9. What does that mean? Because we're not used to degrees, what does that mean? We can see that the range of vertical dimension increase is about 13 millimeters. When we look at this, we look at his lower face height and we look at the norms and we can see that from, I'm going to just put my laser pointer on here for you guys. And okay, we can see that to get close to the, close to the norm, we're looking at the difference between minus three and 10, uh, 13 millimeters, that's a huge, that's a huge amount of opening. I already said that we know we can do five. We know we can do five millimeters. It says in the research, we can do five millimeters and, and it's predictable and safe. In his case, we need, we need a lot of opening, but I would be afraid to go to 13 for a whole bunch of reasons. We've got um, crown root ratios. We've got patient acceptance. We've got decompensation, he's already a class two. If I open him up 13 millimeters, then there's, there's no way he's not going to be another half, at least half or, or a, a, another cusp class two. And, and I don't know what, uh, then, it, then what we do is create a huge surgical, a, a huge surgical problem for him where he'd need um, maxillofacial surgery to correct and he doesn't want that. So again, we're back to making compromises here, but we're working within some standards knowing that what we do to get into a, an acceptable deviation or an acceptable standard deviation from the norm is, is 38.7. Remember before we, got, we did get into the green, um, and we're into the one standard deviation. So um, we're looking at this potentially. 
going from 35 to 38.7 with a seven millimeter, that, that creates minus three to four. Um, we see that the pin value from minus three to four is seven. So it's a plus seven increase in, 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 si in, in size of pin. And so we're looking at plus seven to plus eight in that range. This is where we'll start with our diagnostic wax up. First, we've got to do some orthodontics and we've got to do, we've got to build up the anteriors a little bit with just some composite and, and lingual surfaces, some pads, and we're going to intrude some teeth and control our forces and level the, uh, the over eruption. And then when we get to that point, we're going to do a preliminary wax up and go to full arch temporization with our concept being a full cusp class two on the right side with one to two contacts and a class one left side with one to two contacts. But you're looking at the chocolate side again. This isn't the important side. The critical view is to see that you've got those contacts on the, ling on the lingual view. We've got, we've got cuffs to marginal, two marginal ridges. That's a one to two contact. Okay, this, that's the ideal thing we're striving for. Um, and we have the ability to wax that in. That's what, that's what we go for. Um, you must evaluate your orthodontic and prosthodontic work from the inside view. It's really, really important. And the same approach to vertical dimension applies in a high angle or excess vertical cases. This is a skeletal class two case. And again, another severe skeletal class two case with excess lower face height. We're going to cover this case in detail at the at the end. So I'm just going through those quickly to show that the same approach applies whether it's a high vertical or low vertical case using your cephalometrics and your vertical to, to control your vertical dimension. So last but not least on this part is compensation curves. And we refer to the curves of Spee and Wilson. We're looking specifically at the curve of Spee because what does it do? It increases stability and chewing efficiency. Nature, nature gives us these curves, and obviously this um, friend of ours has a, a, a no curve of speed. He has a totally flat relationship from his joints to his teeth. He has no other function except a, a hinge. The long axis of the mandible of anterior teeth are located at right angles to the closing radius of the mandible. That's as was referred to as Page's law. With setting the teeth up on a curve of speed, it more proportion, it more positions them angled so that they're more directed to the angles of force of the closing arc of the teeth. We can measure that. Ortlieb and Speed did some studies, and the larger the DPO, the smaller the curve of speed. The DPO is the distance of occlusion, distance to occlusion from the axis orbital plane to the occlusal plane. The larger the DPO, the smaller the curve of speed, or the deeper the arc. The smaller the DPO, the greater the curve of speed. Again, you see that the shorter the DPO, the shorter the DPO, the flatter, the greater the radius and the flatter the curve of speed, the shallower the curve of speed. The greater the DPO, the shorter the radius, and the greater the depth, or the greater the curve or the depth of curve of speed. They've developed templates that have been developed to simplify the use of the curve of speed. And the cephalometric program has a built, it does it for you when you've digitized in that thing. And you can see the curve of speed with a radius of 73.6. And it even draws it on for you. And the templates can be used in your wax up rather than just a straight line where your occlusal plane, you can build in your, when you're waxing a, a curve of speed in, into that. can see how that works. It's straightforward. It's interesting to note that depending on the skeletal relation and the position of the molars within the arch, this arc can pass 
on the hinge axis, behind the hinge axis, or ahead of the hinge axis. So let's look at some exercises to put this new knowledge into practice. Okay, if we consider, if you can change the occlusal plane, what effect this will have on the amount of disclusion and the masticatory efficiency. We want to see that six to eight degrees of disclusion of the posterior teeth provides for a safety factor during parafunctional movement while allowing for the posterior teeth to come as close together as possible during an incursive chewing movement without the potential of working side or non-working side interferences. We saw this before, the disocclusion angle. So let's look at an example. Here we have a big angle of disclusion, 20 degrees. All right, these are our pretend teeth. We've got a sagittal condylar inclination of 45 degrees. We've got an occlusal plane that is parallel to axis orbital plane. So you know from your geometry that where that line intersects, if this is 45, we know this is 45, right? So the relative condylar inclination is 45. That's where this intersects this angle. This angle is the relative condylar inclination. And it's 45, it's the same because this angle is parallel, or this line, axis orbital plane, is parallel to occlusal plane. So now we add in a cusp inclination of 25 degrees. So we have a cusp inclination of 25 degrees. We have a sagittal condylar inclination of 45 degrees and we have a zero occlusal plane. The disocclusion angle is the sagittal condylar inclination minus the occlusal plane minus the relative condylar inclination and it equals 20 degrees in this case. So we have a huge amount of disclusion. That would be inefficient, but we wouldn't have any interferences. You just wouldn't have very good chewing ability. That's the example of that. You see old denture patients that come in and, and their occlusal plane is, is pointing down into their mouth like this. It's dropped down because the, the, the ridges have all resorbed and the dentures have dropped down like that. The jaws come forward and as it does that, the, the the mandible goes down and everything sinks down in. These people can't, no matter what they do, they can't, they can't chew well. The, the best thing you can do for those people is, is get that occlusal plane up into a, a, reasonable, a reasonable plane again so that they, the teeth come closer together. Next example, so let's, the axis orbital plane stays the same, but this time we have an occlusal plane of 30 degrees. This is going to the other extreme. This is that high angle case. So we've got a sagittal condylar inclination again of 45 degrees and we've got an occlusal plane of 30 degrees. So we've got a relative condylar inclination this time of 15. And we still got a cusp inclination of 25 because we haven't, we haven't changed that. We haven't adjusted that yet. So we've got a cusp inclination of 25. So that means that when we subtract 45, 30 from 45 and 25 from that, we get minus 10. So that means we have 10 degrees of interference. Okay, 10 degrees of interference in that case. Let's see another example. Let's look at this and go the, we've got a sagittal condylar inclination of 50. This is more realistic. We've got a relative, we've got an occlusal plane of 12 degrees. We've got a relative condylar inclination, which is not right. Um, and because I didn't change it, um, sorry about that, of 10 degrees. And we've got, Sorry about that. Okay. Let's just see what we've got. Okay, so where did I go wrong here? We've got 
Sorry about that. Okay, so if we've got a relative condor inclination of 50 degrees, and we've got an occlusal plane of 12 degrees, and we've got a cusp inclination of 30 degrees, that gives us eight degrees of disclusion. If we flatten the occlusal plane, it increases our disclusion angle. So if we do another exercise, if the cusp inclination is 30 degrees, occlusal plane of eight degrees gives us seven degrees of occlusion, disocclusion. An occlusal plane of minus six gives us 21 degrees. And an occlusal plane of 16 gives us only one degree of disclusion. So the occlusal plane of eight degrees works out pretty well. The occlusal plane of 16 is way too steep and we're not, there's no way you're going to be able to equilibrate out all those interferences. And the 21 degrees is just way too low and we're gonna have no efficiency in our uh, very inefficient chewing apparatus. So we have a brief overview of some of the concepts we use for diagnosis and treatment planning of the occlusal scheme. And I'd like to finish um, with another case just to review some concepts that I've tried to introduce today. So this is Ed. He has a diagnosis of a skeletal class two, lower face height, severely increased. He has MLD, which in, for us is mandibular lateral displacement. His midline's off due to a functional shift of his mandible to one side or the other. He has occlusal plane asymmetry from one side to the other. He has advanced periodontal disease. He's just, he's just a, a great guy in, in tough shape and he, he's had some bad, bad dentistry over the years and this is how he presents. When looking at, his, at a couple of condylography things, we know that um, on the left side, this, this, is a, this is mastication. So we can see that he's chewing bilaterally, but when he chews on this side, he has a severe dislocation and, and a huge clunky clicky thing with distraction. And, and this is very debilitating for him in chewing. Um, when he bruxes, the same kind of thing. This is a very fairly normal bruxing pattern. He's bruxing back and forth on, on the left side. This joint's working quite well. He's bruxing back and forth. And this side's going up and down like a, like a hammer hitting a nail. He's, his bite is very unstable. He has lots of muscle involvement and he's constantly searching for a place that his bite feels like he can land and relax. You can appreciate that he's shifting from one side to the other, trying to find a place where he can come into some sort of uh, reliable ICP. So I want you to focus on his lower face height, the occlusal plane and the sagittal condylar inclination. Remember that we can change two out of three to, to help us reach our therapeutic goal for Ed. We can't change sagittal condylar inclination, but we can change lower face height and we can change occlusal plane. When we look at lower face height, we can see that he's two standard deviations way out the other side of, of, of normal. He is a really high vertical dimension. And his occlusal plane is very, very steep. Ed's got an extremely high vertical dimension with a hyperdivergent mandible, which means a counterclockwise rotation. It also means that the mandible cannot position forward. By lowering the occlusal plane, it's possible to get some articular compensation no matter how old the patient is. That means by changing the occlusal plane as a, as a therapy, it's possible for Ed to actually uh, move forward, move his mandible and feel more comfortable forward. Remember in this position with his joints, he's displaced, his joints are back to begin with. So he's he wants to come forward, but this occlusal plane, this steep occlusal plane is keeping him, keeping him from being able to um, come forward at all. So we're hoping for some articular compensation in our treatment also. So we look at the table and it quickly becomes apparent that we can't normalize him without a surgical intervention. He can't go, we can't get him, uh, here's my cursor, we can't, 
we can't get him from, from this point, this little red line on uh, into the green. We cannot get here. That would be like 20 millimeters of, of closing. So, but we, we can, we, so our objective is to see where we, where we can go. So he declines a surgical approach and would consider a prosthetic reconstruction. He, he doesn't want to win a beauty contest, but he'd truly love to enjoy a good steak. So with that in mind, we can look at, at a, a vertical compensation or change and, and we look at, at seeing where we can go. So by taking this rotational control and changing the vertical uh, at the incisal pin by about seven millimeters, we haven't changed a whole lot. You can see that for even from the last example that a change of three or four degrees at the anterior pin at the anterior um, only changes um, the vertical here by seven or eight millimeters at the at the at six or seven millimeters on the anterior pin height, but that's that's a that's a that's a lot. So, um, but um, it does get our occlusal plane into rather rather normal normal values. So will that work? Let's look at Ed. The functional geometry for Ed looks like this. Remember our lateral guidance can never be greater than 60 degrees. The inclination approaches 60. The difference between the horizontal condylar inclination and the interior guidance decreases closer to zero. Greater inclinations appear to restrict mandibular forward repositioning and induce more joint pathology. I discussed that already. So Ed we're, has a sagittal condylar inclination average between the two of 52.6. He has an occlusal plane of 11.8. And if we go with really sharp dissecting cusps and uh, for maximum efficiency, we could look at something like this, where SCI minus occlusal plane minus cusp inclination equals the disclusion angle. And that works out to be 10.8 degrees, plugging those factors in. So for, from that standpoint, it looks like a good working situation for us. Also remember a couple other things um, that when you're looking at occlusal plane and the lip embrasure, we've got to look at incisal length, the coupling, how much thickness we're going to have. Can we couple by building them up with crowns? Can we couple by moving the mandible forward a little bit? Can we couple with orthodontics to change the inclination of the anterior teeth? And we also have to look at occlusal plane relative to reduction um, when we're looking at occlusing, changing the occlusal plane and we're not using orthodontics, are we going to be reducing mostly on the upper or mostly on the lower or half and half between the two? But we need to consider those factors also when we're, when we're plan going ahead with our planning. And then we can take our, from our, our articulation, we can take and plan, we've already talked about this, how we plan our, our incisal guidance. He's going to have a tendency with his skeletal frame, you know he's going to have a tendency. The functional dividing plane is going to be, you can see the functional dividing plane right here, almost to the molars. We're going to know that he's going to have a strong tendency towards group function. So that's going to be our concept going forward. And we're going to use these pre-milled guide tables corresponding to his dynamic condylar situation. And you can see that each one of these each one of these tables has a different sequential guidance based on where we're starting with the anterior teeth. The table, the table can slide and we do one tooth at a time. We'll, do the, we'll start at the back, then we'll go to the five, then we'll go to the four, then we'll go to the three, and then we'll do the front teeth. And there's a little combination in between for the lateral incisor to make sure that you're not, it doesn't become the guidance, the guidance system. So we actually do the three or we go to the four, we do the two and then come back to the three. Otherwise you'll have those situations where the guidance is on the lateral, the distal incisal line angle of the uh, lateral incisor and you're always chipping it off. So the articulator was fully programmed according to the condylography and after long-term temps, we tried to reduce the occlusal plane to about 12 degrees. This puts us in a safe range 
considering the seclusion angle and also supports our concept of mandibular repositioning by leveling the occlusal plane. The mandible was always in a retreated position with, uh, with a steep occlusal plane in the fossa. It cannot escape that with a steep occlusal plane. And the final prosthesis was done in quadrants. I never do any full arches anymore for patients with joint problems. So to finish, just a couple thoughts. Don't forget about function and occlusion. You can harmonize function and aesthetics, but you have to have excellent cooperation with your dental technician to do this kind of thing. My thanks to Stefan Provencher, my lab technician in Montreal, and just to mention, I want just if you want any other information, you can visit us at uh, the www.visitcanada.org website. And this is the end of the road. So stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much for your attention. Take care, everybody. I think I've Thank done. You. Thank you, Doctor. A little, little bit early, Timmy. Oh, questions? that's okay. Uh, thank you very much. Wow. That is a tough subject to present and nice job. So how did you uh, get hooked up with the Vienna? How did that come about? My, my, it, it's a, to make a long story, my, my father-in-law was, a, was a, a dentist. He's no longer with us, but when I got out of school, um, he was uh, working, he was teaching functional appliances in, in, in Europe to Dr. Slavicek's study group. And they became, this is back in 19, in the 70s. And so when, when I graduated, the first thing he, in 79, my first year in Chicago was 1980. He took me to a room to, and I met a bunch of people like, and Dr. Slavicek was going to present for the first time in Chicago and um, he couldn't even speak English. So Carl Worth did it at the time. But I was sitting in this room listening to these guys talk about, and I just graduated from dental school. So I thought I was, uh, you know, I was brilliant and I knew everything. And these guys were talking about um, things about occlusion that, that I, I just never even heard of before. And that's when I, that was my first exposure to Dr. Slavicek. And so from there, I, I uh, got mixed up with some, guys in California that had heard him, Morris Corbett and, uh, and Dr. Roth and a couple other people, but um, they, didn't, they didn't stay with it. And Dr. Slavicek got sick and couldn't travel anymore. So um, I finally had to start going, you know, Mohammed go to the mountain kind of thing. Um, I started going to Vienna in 1986, I guess. And uh, I've, been, I've been part of that in and out of, uh, in and out of, I say, life. Um, ever since. But the last few years, I've been going to Vienna working on, on this for, for them over there. And uh, so that's been my exposure. And, and um, of, of course, I've, I've heard most uh, of the North American stuff, but it's just a little bit different and, and um, not what we typically get in the dental schools here. So I thought I would expose everybody to it and, and uh, wait for the, the, uh, the criticism to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we had uh, uh, somebody wants you to throw up your last so slide with the contact information there uh, for the sure, sure. Ed, uh, and is, uh, is that it? No, yeah, we've got uh, uh, what thickness of articulating paper to use for checking and adjusting occlusion. Ah, uh, that's a whole that's a whole thing, but. Um, we're, we're using, we're really using shim stock and, and checking it with a thing called Brux checker, which is a, a, a well, plastic I, mylar template. Do you know what? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, from the, uh, uh, with the suck down. You, you, yes. You, yeah. Yes. It's just a clear man. And, and um, we, we actually do that. It's really interesting now with the new, with the new, um, materials especially zirconia trying to mark it trying to adjust it is mm -hmm. uh, is a hideous horrendous problem and so typically i'll use the brux checker ahead of ahead of an appointment and during the appointment because i can i can see the places where it's a problem and i can just grind right you know right through it and use it use it with it in the mouth so uh, your case is that so on a case so that has been 
completed and seeded yes. that you're going to do it? Okay. Yes. Interesting. And that's a Biostar Rux checker? Yes. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Uh, considering that uh, comprehensive orthodontic treatment invariably results in flatter curve of speed and nearly same cuspal inclination, how would that affect occlusal plane and the muscles of mastication as well as vertical dimension and the patient's profile at rest? Well, that's a lot in the question. Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of mixed up stuff in that, in that question. So let me start with flattening the occlusal plane. I mean, Andrews and, and, and the straight wire concept really, really goes counterproductive to um, a reasonable approach to dynamic occlusion. We have so many finished ortho cases that need equilibration that are very difficult to equilibrate because the occlusal plane isn't right and they wouldn't need it the equilibration even if the if the curve of speed and they were coupled properly but the the curve of speed when we flatten everything we the the if the if the arches and the teeth were the right shape to couple nature gave you the right teeth to couple and the right shape and we take out the curve of speed which nature gave us then it it it, and then we try to pull all the teeth together, something's got to give. And it usually gives with the freeway space and the inclination of the anterior teeth. We end up with minimal overbite overjet and a very steep relationship. And that's basically because we've, we've flattened the curves. Now that's, that's my answer to the curve of speed question. And the, what, was the, what was the other mix of stuff? Oh, uh, the muscles of mastication and vertical dimension. Vertical dimension can be, the muscles of mastication will adjust very rapidly within a two week period to most, most verticalization. The thing is, if you go, it, it's, it's, you have more trouble if you go with somebody that's a low vertical and make them even lower than you do taking somebody that, that needs verticalization, but it's based on skeletal. It's not based on just, I need space, so I'm gonna go and open the patients up. The, 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 the things I, the tools I gave you today show that there, there are ranges and norms that you can easily open somebody like, like Mr. Judd. If, if I needed to, I could open him up 15 millimeters. He could tolerate it, but I, I got a crown root ratio problem when I start building crowns that are bigger than the roots. Okay, so, um, but I, you'd have no problem opening somebody like that up. But you, if you do, you create other problems. Now, if you had a class three case that you could, that, a low angle class three case, that's, you know, um, you could open them up and create a class one and open them up maybe 10 millimeters and get away and get away with it if the if the roots are strong enough or long enough to do it but um certainly that would that would i say de compensate them by opening them up and changing the vertical those are good good cases to do it but it's based on skeletal type and uh somebody didn't like your answer to the articulating paper so they typed back in yeah, yeah. capital letters what, what thickness of our what thickness yeah yeah what, stock. what 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 thickness um i don't even i don't even know what thickness <laughs> of i guess that's a good answer sorry uh, it's the same uh, as it's the same as my shim stock i know that but I, yeah. I can't tell you what the thickness is sorry uh, that's that's okay uh uh what are your thoughts on the t-scan the t-scan um it the what what would you use it for? Well, I think they're uh, thinking in, along the lines of articulation, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the first instrument I bought. If I had everything else and I had lots of money, it would be a a, a fun tool to play with. But I think that um, it's going to collect a lot of dust on the shelf if you're a young dentist thinking of going in a different direction and i, I would he, think would, would he would that person like to buy one 
I, I, I don't know if they're looking at buying one or not, or if they yeah. use one and, you know. Just checking. Send me your name. Oh, <laughs> I, have, I have a used one. Yeah. Okay. What's your preferred method to get CR position? Do you use an anterior deprogrammer? Ah, uh, okay, Grasshopper. Um, whoever asked that, if they have time, um, my colleague is giving a whole hour and a half presentation on sent on reference position, which is what we call centric relation. If he looks up in the glossary of prostodontic terms, centric relation, he'll see that the latest edition, GT9, is um, a big long paragraph and it ends with the two words reference position. And we in, in, in our, in, and we don't really like that definition for a couple of reasons that I don't have time to get into, but, but first, but Dr. Tester in his next presentation is going to do an hour and a half on this. And I think he's really going to cover it well, but centric, centric relation is our reference. We, we call it reference position. And there's a little bit of variation because our reference position applies to people, whether they're on the disc or in the disc or they're deranged or they, they have internal derangements and other problems in the joint. I can only use centric relation by definition when the, when the joints are healthy. So I use reference position. Okay. Um, and so, um, and again, what was the question? <laughs> I, I, I probably didn't answer it. I'm sorry. No, no, you did. That's fine. Uh, uh, okay. it was basically, how do you get CR? But since Dr. Tester is going to do an hour and a half, let's leave that up to him. Okay. I, for, for one thing, for sure, um, you, you, can, you can deprogram all, all you like on, on myopathic patients. Ab absolutely. And then at the end of the day, it's a, it's a patient registered registration without, without any guidance or any control. And, and those are the key things. But if he watches Dr. Tester's, if he has time to watch Dr. Tester's presentation, uh, he's going to cover it in great, deal, in great detail for an hour and a half. That's his topic. Okay, fantastic. Super. Thank you for plugging our next speaker. Nice right on. Done. Uh, okay, when performing full mouth rehabilitation on a full set of severely worn dentition, would you advise to do segmental reconstruction or a full arch at once? I, I think you've already mentioned what you like to do, but yeah, there's two, there's, there's, there's two possibilities. Um, you, when you start increasing vertical, um, you're, you're locked into, um, you know, kind of an all, all at once kind of program. I know some people, um, and, and I, I talked about this with a, with a colleague of mine last week and that he does an anteriors first and he'll build up the anteriors and let the patient go, for a, a couple of weeks just on the anterior occlusion and 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 then he'll do the posteriors and and be just from a timing standpoint it, it's very difficult to manage these patients because once you get over three hours of, of time in the dental chair um, uh, that's uh, that's a whole other you know a whole other game and so um, but basically he'll do that the caveat to that if if patients are myopathic patients, first of all, there's a, there's a group, there's a healthy group. Let's just divide it up into three groups for simplicity. There's your healthy patients with good, good joints and, and normal joint condyle relationships or, or discondyle relationships. And then there's a group of patients that are just have lots of myopathic problems, muscular problems, but the joints are basically intact. And then there's a group with deranged or arthrotic kind of conditions going on in the joint. Those patients don't do well when you just put them on anterior occlusions. They need posterior occlusions to stabilize. So you got to build up, you got to build up the posterior. If you can only do it in quadrants, you got to build up, you know, back teeth and then, and then bottom back, then bottom top back and then, and then front and then go back. And when you've got everything prepped and everything temporized, then you got to go and redo all the temporaries again. So you start by just getting, getting rid of all the bad stuff, getting your cores built up, getting everything done. And then you get some temporaries based on what they've, what they've still got. And then when you, then when you get to that point with all the teeth, then you can go back and, and start building your, your pre-made ideal wax up temporary crowns. And you're maybe going to do the temporary crown thing on those people well, more than one time, because as you just say, you're, you're, you know, you're perfecting and going more precision as you go, as you go towards the end. So um, you, you, you can't go from A to Z in one appointment with those people. 
Okay. And oh, that brings up another point. This that just I was going to say when you talk about long appointments and trying to do these reconstructions, um, working under the new COVID cape, COVID cape um, by the time you get the mask and the gloves and the screen and the hat and the goggles and you get your 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 light off your loops going inside your the the face mask, and uh, I don't know how we're going to work for three hours at a time, Timmy. Yeah, uh, you better take a pee first, right? Like, oh, like putting your snowsuit on. I'm, I'm going to hook myself up to an IV. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Anyway, yeah. so I hope that answered his question or her question. Yeah, I, I believe so. So uh, you go to a lot of dental meetings. You've been to meetings in Europe. Uh, for somebody that's occlusion focused, where would you suggest that they, what meetings to go to or, uh, you know, here in, in the... Listen, we have we have some great programs. Of, of course, um, you know we got Dawson and Panky, and and I know um, Mike Fling is at, at Panky, and he's a great supporter of and of Cardup and and a, a good friend, and and um, the the Kois and and Spears Academy. We've got some great academies in in North America. Um, I I find for um, my my European experience has been wonderful. Of course, you get to travel. It, it costs me the same to fly to Vancouver. If I go to IDEA in, in uh, San Francisco, in, in uh, um, Foster City, um, great program there. And, uh, but it costs me, I can, go to, I can go to Vienna cheaper. So if I get a chance and my wife gets a chance to go to Europe versus going to California, um, Sorry, I'm. I guess I'm going to Europe, but uh, they 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 have they have some. They're they're very. Um, they're they're the instrumentation is a big factor over there, and I find we tend not to not to be very structured or very concerned about our our accuracy or our instrumentation here, and so um, I I I like I like their approach, um, and so. Uh, um, that's it. So I'd recommend any of those programs to start. Um, but if you're, if you're really from uh, my prosthetic point by being able to, to get through and understand a lot of things that I'm doing and understand how the, the people are functioning. Um, I, I like, I like the, the Viz Ed program. I think they've, they've been doing it for a number of years. Last year, they taught over a thousand students. Hmm. Um, they're in a bunch of different countries. We're just, Dr. Tester and I are starting the one in Canada um, in this fall. It was supposed to be November. Hopefully it is. We'll depend on this, this particular uh, um, epidemic pandemic, but we'll see. Um, yeah. But any of those, I, I highly recommend uh, any of the guys. And, and um, I think what I've, what I've found talking to people that have taken those programs is that um, it's a good it's a good starting point and um our program may be just a little different than that when you when you've done those other when you've done those other programs so uh um i hope i hope that helps i'm i uh yeah you know and a common theme in so many of these webinars has been when i've been watching the q a people are asking about occlusion 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 where do i learn and I, you know the the schools uh just aren't doing a good job of it anymore no. This is if, if you want to if you want to learn occlusal medicine, I don't think there's a and I'm 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 biased now. Be I get, I do they do pay me to be a you know run work in the clinical part of the program, um, but as far as occlusion, um, I took my I took my first wax up course from Peter K Thomas. I took my next wax up course from Charlie Stewart, and when I took Slavichek's course, my lab partner was Harry Lundin. And, and he, I got, I got a picture to show you, I could show you, I'd prove it. Um, um, <laughs> because I'm, I'm, you probably think I'm BSing this poor guy that, that asked the question, but um, um, he, he said, and, and so he, he was there, there was Carl Gacchino and, and, and Harry, and there's a bunch of us. And he, he just said like, Slavicek has put it together better than anybody else. It's nothing new from nath, nath from a nathological standpoint. He is just, with this, with this sequential wax up from back to front, 
individually doing one tooth at a time, basically. Um, he, has, he has created a very systematic approach to learning occlusion. And when the kids take this program, they learn everything about our, you know, articulation, programming, instrumentation, jaw tracking. They do wax ups. They, they, do, they do a class one wax up. Um, and uh, they get, they get a, in, in, uh, um, in the 15 days, they get a ton of information. So um, yeah, from that standpoint, I don't think there's any other course that, as comprehensive. Um, and we get, and most of the students in, in uh, um, Europe have, have only been out like 10 years or less. And, and amazingly enough, a ton of orthodontics, orthodontists taking occlusion courses, a, a ton. All righty. Well, thank you, Dr. Parlett. I'm going to take control of your screen here. Please do, Tim. And uh, Listen, I, take care, know, everybody. Be safe and be well. Bye now. Know, that was terrific that you put that together for us. Fantastic. And uh, thank you for being such a good friend. And just you too, a, Timmy. A big take thanks care. to Card P for putting today together. Uh, this is the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontic uh, Day. Um, You'll see some flyers going by. These are some of the speakers that we've had this week. Uh, the International Academy of Nathology uh, had three speakers for us on Monday that did a fantastic job. Hey, for those of you that are uh, interested in what's happening with your CE credit, you're getting your CE credits through the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE program. Those CE credits will show up in your email inbox within two to three days. Look for a PDF in there. It's not not personalized. Just put your information on that PDF and save that for your, your boards or your state uh, licensure, etc. just in case there's an issue. Uh, for those of you that are AGD members, and we strongly encourage you to become an AGD member, uh, we will report your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, you should see those show up on your transcripts within the next two to four weeks. For those of you that uh, are interested in um, hands-on courses towards your mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry, go to our website, washingtonagd.org. We have orthodontic uh, programs. We have an implant continuum. We have what's called our master track program, which is four sessions. Uh, each session has over 28 hours of CE and some of the uh, speakers that you've seen over the weeks will be presenting there uh, in the 2020 2021 uh, uh, master track series and what we've done is we've actually done uh, a reduction in uh, pricing on that so uh, we've rolled back uh, from $5,500 for AGD members to $4,000 so uh, it's good value. Uh, I know many of you uh, are interested in the answers uh, that Terry Harris had to your questions. Uh, he's working on those questions and those should be emailed out sometime here in the next couple of days. Just a reminder, our next speaker on for Card P Day is uh, Dr. Ian Tester. He's going to go uh, deep dive into centric relation. God bless him. Uh, that's a, <laughs> that is a tough topic. And, uh, you know, uh, so you with, yeah, yep. like, to, like to remind you, Dr. Karbash is lecturing tomorrow about COVID-19, getting ready for practice, evolving systems. She's put a lot of effort into this presentation and it's really designed for you and your staff uh, to to get on board with the uh, use of masks, how you're going to pre-screen patients and those type of things to, you know, there's a lot of information out there, but she's going to try and work on some systems there. And uh, we might actually have her come back next week also with uh, some of the programs that we have focused more on dental offices and their staff. Um, there's QR codes on the flyers that are going by. You can use those to register for upcoming CE events. You can go to wagd.org, or pardon me, washingtonagd.org. Uh, and if you would like to see previous webinars, those are on YouTube. And that's Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, remember to go to Facebook and type in there, uh, or click like and so you'll know what's coming up 
uh, from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, thank you to Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society, and Comet USA and Patterson Dental for helping put these uh, webinars together. Uh, thank you. We will uh, be starting up uh, about 10 minutes uh, before 2.30 Pacific Standard Time, so 2.20. You'll be able to jump on the webinar and uh, we'll be able to welcome Dr. Ian Tester. I just want to say a uh, shout out to all the Card P members that have joined us today. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, you see the great white north banner behind there. I'm actually a, a Canadian, but better than that, I'm an Albertan. So, alrighty. Yeah. With that, uh, thank you. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Gary Hayamoto and our executive director, Valerie Bartoli, for joining us on this webinar. Thanks, guys. We'll see you at 2.30. See you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Parlett. Uh, you too, Gary. Take care, buddy. Timmy, time, yes, for a be time for a beer. <laughs> for you, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you, I'm, guys. You take uh, care. Yeah, I've been sitting here. I'm going to get a glass of wine for Ian now. So, well, not for him, but for me to watch him. So that. <laughs> uh, terrific. Thank you yeah. again for putting it together. Oh, no. Thank you, guys, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much. I can't believe the job. I'm my hand, you know, you guys are great. So, uh, Timmy, take care. I wish we could get together soon, but. Uh, we'll figure out a way. Yeah, it'll be, it'll, it'll come. Take care, buddy. See you now.